Hello, happy Reviews Friday. And normally we are live with you guys for these reviews because we want to hear what you think. We know what we think. We're inside our own heads. Um, but for today, we've done a pre-tape because I got to say, Spencer Gilbert's been doing nothing but complaining about how tired he is the whole time we've been in quarantine. And finally, oh, I've Spencer. become the tiredness. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, Spencer, we're all going to take a day off. Um, Spencer Gilbert is here to talk about the Batman. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to be here with you as well. And I, I kid, I actually am forcing us all to take a day off as a content team, largely because that means I get an excuse to take a day off as well. So thank you guys for joining us for this. We're going to talk about Batman Begins because it had an anniversary this week. So uh, we had Joe and Danielle talking about Batman Forever yesterday. Um, and I think we flipped, did we flip a coin, Spencer? How, that we got Batman or Begins, or how did that happen? <laughs> you kind of called not it on uh, Batman Forever. <laughs> that is correct. That is that is perhaps what happened. It was um, less you random. Know, <laughs> you know what? If you, why have power if you can't abuse it? It's your loss. <laughs> Batman Forever is uh, a fantastic journey into the ecstasy-soaked mind of Joel Schumacher. <laughs> Um, I think I know a lot enough about Joel Schumacher to some degree <laughs> and about ecstasy, quite frankly. Um, Spencer Gilbert, first question for you is how long has it been since you've seen this movie? Probably like a year or two, somewhere in that oh. range. Yeah. That's fairly recent, actually. Yeah. yeah. Probably like the third or probably the fourth time I've seen it. Cause like I saw it, I saw it again. We did the honest trailer for Batman Begins, and then we did the one for every Chris Nolan movie. So I've seen a bunch. It's my favorite Batman movie. Oh, is it really? Yeah. I actually didn't know that coming in because um, I will confess that while I am, I actually, I, I was just telling Spencer that going into this movie, I think I had a pretty strong bias to love it um, when, I, when it first came out because I loved Memento. And I was, I was so behind the idea of this auteur doing a comic book movie and it was gonna be so different. And in fact, it was, it was all of those things. It really did revitalize the genre. Um, it did all of those things that we talk about. And in the moment I was hugely blown away, but interestingly enough, I don't think I've revisited it all that often. So I hadn't seen it in quite a while this time. Um, my favorite Batman movie, I'm, Michael Keaton's still my favorite Batman. Don't at me. I beg of you. I'm trying to have a weekend off. But Spencer, <laughs> tell me why this is your favorite Batman movie. I won't just say it's my favorite Batman movie. I'll say this is the only Batman movie. And what I mean by that is it's the only movie about Batman. Um, this is uh, uh, specifically Bruce Wayne uh, and Batman. So every single other film, it's uh, the more interesting character is the antagonist. Uh, right. I'll, I'll just Joker, more interesting. Uh, Catwoman, more interesting. You, you go on and on and on. And this one, they made the worst part of every Batman movie, Bruce Wayne, into the best part. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing sleight of hand uh, by Christopher Nolan. And it just works. It's a fantastic movie it, uh, on its own terms. I think if this wasn't a Batman movie, it would still be a great film about like a weird, angry billionaire who can't let go of his vengeance and fear who becomes a vigilante. Yeah, It works on that level. And yet it also is amazingly respectful and uh, and manages to work in so much the iconography and history of, of Batman and like piece together all these parts of other origin stories and make it work as a Batman story. But I truly think that this is a great movie even without being a Batman story, if that makes sense. It does make a lot of sense because I was thinking the same thing on the rewatch where we were, I think, 45 minutes into the movie and I think I had sort of disconnected. I was really so engaged in him as a character that I sort of disconnected from the idea of that that he was also Batman and he was going to be Batman um, because I think you're right. It really just like if this had been a different film and he went back and um, hi, Batman, thank you for joining us today. We'd love <laughs> to hear your thoughts on the film as well. Um, yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more that it really, particularly in that first hour and a half, really works on its own just as a film aside from being a Batman movie. Now, again, the last 45 minutes or so when he begins, that's what the film is, it's a Batman movie um, and, it, and it's about his his start. And, and I think we really truly, we hadn't seen the kind of deconstruction of that the first iteration, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, I, I know you will, um, that the first iteration of his costume doesn't really work, you know, or it's not quite right and things are failing a little bit. Not so much that it's belaboring the point in the way that Kick-Ass did. Or, well, I like Kick-Ass by the way, but that that is the point. Um, but in a way that I think it really did find a way to ground this and have us believe in this. It didn't have to feel larger than life. It felt like life. 
Yeah, um, I, I think that the uh, realism so often comes uh, paired with the word gritty, with gritty realism. But in my rewatch, I was surprised by it wasn't as gritty and grim dark as as I remembered or, or as its reputation is. It really was just grounded. It was real. There was a real world explanation for every little piece of machinery and every little doodad and it fit and it didn't pause the story either it wasn't like uh like the midichlorian scene where they just pause and explain to you how the magic stuff works like it was the the explanation of uh wayne enterprises using these prototypes and he's in this division with lucius fox it's just kind of shut away it, it, it's like oh of course that that makes sense or at least in the world of the film like that's enough of an explanation for me to completely buy this and buy that we're in a real world version of batman yeah. And um, I want to quickly ask you a question and it doesn't it's I'm going to go off the topic of this movie for one moment. So forgive me. Um, but returning to the idea of this being the only Batman movie. So you think that the Michael Keaton Batman, the first one that the Penguin is or the Joker is more interesting than Batman in that film as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, that guy with the jukebox, what's his deal? Like the <laughs> <laughs> and the purple suit? Yeah. Way more fun. Uh, and, and like, uh, you know, I, I, I can infer so much uh, about Michael Keaton's uh, version of Bruce Wayne's past and his history just from his crazy eyes. But I think that um, taking the entire first hour of the film to just be Bruce Wayne um, and to pay all uh, to pay off every single thing about like his childhood. It wasn't just a montage. It was like you got some real meaty scenes of his childhood, of his not his adolescence, because he's like pretty jumps around in time. How old do you think he is when he's in Mongolia beating up random people? So, so, and that's the interesting thing is like when we, he, when we flash back to when he leaves, he looks and they've managed to, and I will give credit to the hair department very specifically in this movie because they managed to make Christian Bale look really young and doofy just with bangs. Yeah. I mean, like, that's it. That's, that's what's doing the work in that scene to make you believe he's young. He see, he appears to be maybe 19 in that scene. So I get the sense that maybe six years have passed and he's a very gruff looking 25 or 26 year old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I don't think, um, it's an amazing show of trust, I guess, in, in Warner brothers, in, in Chris Nolan and Chris Nolan and his audience to say that, you know what, like, I'm not going to give you any Batman until over an hour into the film. Um, that takes a lot of guts and they still manage to give you, there's some great action sequences. My favorite part of the film is uh, his, his final, his graduation ceremony from Ninja school or whatever you want to call it. Me too. Yeah. Of him, uh, him sneaking around and tricking Liam Neeson and stuff, which again is paid off at the train at the end. Um, I mean, we can't get too much further without talking about just the craft of this. And like, it's just like such a well-oiled machine. And Chris Nolan directs this with such confidence. And like, it's, uh, the score is great. Uh, the the performances are great. Like, it, it, put, putting the story aside, it's just a beautiful movie. Um, I agree. And I, mean, I think you could easily... Uh say that about any Chris Nolan movie in terms of the craftsmanship. Like if there, if there are issues with the film, it's typically, and we won't get into that, um, but if there are any issues with any of his films, not necessarily this one, it's typically in the script. Um, the craftsmanship is almost always there outside of, I will reflect and please don't at me again, I'm trying to have a weekend, um, that he has an issue with sound design. Um, not perhaps like the levels are all over the place, even in this movie. And this is the best of the sound issues in, in his following films. Um, but he does, he, I can't decide they, they, we had to be turning the volume up and down constantly, um, while watching the movie. And I think there's maybe a little bit of an intention there in certain moments to lean in, you know, and have the audience lean in and listen a little bit harder. Um, but yeah, that's the only area that at all that I would say, I, 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 I wish they had, uh, Michael Bay's people on it in his films is sound design, because as much as I do not like Michael Bay as a filmmaker, the sound design in his films is usually incredible. Um, but outside of that, the cinematography, the production design, the world creation, the acting, every other element of craftsmanship in this film is spectacular. So yeah, I, I didn't I, notice. Uh, I didn't notice the the sound design issues you're talking about. If we're gonna, and yes, the cinematography is incredible. Just like just B roll of like uh, the locations. You know, they're very like Michael Mannish shots of uh, 
I guess Chicago, whatever, whatever's standing in for Gotham, uh, are amazing. And then like when uh, just landscape shots as, as transitions, like they're, they're beautiful. But I think if we're gonna ding him for anything uh, craft-wise, for me, it's you know the the shaky cam, like you're in the action fight sequences. I think that it's super. It works super well at that uh, sequence down at the docks where you're kind of in the shoes of the of the goons as they're getting picked off one by one. But I think he he draws on that for like a lot of the fights to the point where like it's disorienting and you don't know who's who and it's just this kind of big figure taking guys out and, and, and with quick cuts and shaky cam and stuff like that. It doesn't really you don't really get a sense of the combat until the final the final showdown with him and and Ra's al Ghul. So, I, I, and I think that's something he he uh, grew out of in, in the future Batman movies. Like you could actually see Batman fighting. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I probably a thing that he would say, I don't know, I don't speak for Christopher Nolan, certainly, um, is, is the interesting part for him is the filmmaking, first and foremost. Like, I think I've shared on this show before that that hallway sequence in Inception, I literally want to have sex with it and get pregnant with amazing short films. Like, it just blows me away every single time. I love that sequence, just the filmmaking um and the and the acting you know like the character which is great because that's what's most interesting to us as well but when you work like i would love to see him work with like david leach who understands how character can be revealed through fight sequences and revealed through the stunts um i think that pairing just on those sequences in his films would be through the roof um but that said and that aside let's talk about the character so I think you've already stated at the top when we're looking back on these films, our question is, what was this movie trying to do? Um, and I think really what this movie was trying to do is absolutely what it did do and what we've all said that it did, which was give us a depiction of Batman that we could sink our teeth into and imagine a world in which uh, under very different, radically different circumstances, that could be me um, and create that level of empathy and connection and catharsis with that character. Mission accomplished. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that 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 was the only goal of this film was to uh it wasn't so much Batman Begins as it was, you know, Bruce Wayne ends. It was the growth of Bruce Wayne from a uh, spoiled little rich kid who was afraid of the dark to someone who and just wanted vengeance, you know, he was about to just shoot Joe Chill, you know, Reagan assassin style just as he was walking around to somebody who uh, used fear for allegedly a greater good, though he rides that line, which is always what's interesting about Batman. How much is he driven by vengeance and how much is he driven by some sense of justice to, uh, to something greater than himself? And I, I think it did that perfectly. Yeah, and I think it also, um... Do you, I mean, to your earlier point, I remember always thinking that Michael Keaton was my favorite Batman, but that Christian Bale was my favorite Bruce Wayne. Um, and I think that's that ki that still holds true um, for me. Um, and this movie is all about Bruce, to your point. And, and I would it, switch it, that, though, frankly. I just love Keaton as a as a Bruce Wayne because he's just such a maniac. I mean, I get I, I understand it's just personal enjoyment because I understand uh uh, Bruce Wayne, uh, Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne, he still has so much like contained fury in him. He's still kind of like, he. there's a little bit of American psycho residual Patrick Bateman-ness in him um, uh, to the point where like, uh, I, I don't know, you, you just believe he could snap into Batman at any time where it is, Keaton was just fun. Keaton was just more fun. He was fun and, and I want to be clear, like he wasn't in the suit a ton, to be fair. Yeah. He didn't do a lot of that work. And so this is what I think I mean, and I should clarify. Um, I thought I just disconnected my internet, but apparently not. Um, I don't think there's a lot of differentiation between Keaton's Bruce Wayne and his Batman. Like, I think his Bruce Wayne is also his Batman to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, he's putting on the persona a little bit, but he's also a guy that unlike Christian Bale, which I think is probably more appropriate for Bruce Wayne, who ha actually has no, everything that he's doing around being a playboy is fake. Yeah. It's put on. Um, and it's really clear that he truly has no interest in that. And that he is this very like shy, introverted man who in a different reality would maybe have be Howard Hughes, unclear. Um, Definitely. But he had been, but he'd been forced to take all that fear, and I don't think dispel it, but channel it. I think he's still very afraid, but he just is, he's learned to channel that. Um, yeah, 
And and for me, his Michael Keaton always seemed like, eh, you kind of are also yeah, a playboy. He, he's enjoying that too, <laughs> <You know? laughs> for sure. And, and but why I love Christian Bale's Batman is, um, uh, like that is he, he snaps as Batman. Like he is, he's a monster. He's a uh, uh, he's growling. He's like so physical and like uh, there's just so much like aggression coming out of him at all times. And you have to do that, otherwise you look stupid. It, just standing around, or if you any kind of casualness or, or um, you know, lack of uh, lack of menace when you're standing in this big rubber bat suit, you look dumb. A, a, at no point did I think he looked dumb. They didn't. They never made the mistake of having Batman, you know, go to court in the daytime or anything like that. Christian Bale is always looks like something that just leapt out of you at the uh, leapt out at you in the shadows. Well, I think the other thing to your earlier point about villains, I will say that one of the things that I thought at the time, I thought that Sandman, um, this, pardon me, Sandman, Jesus Christ. Uh, Scarecrow. Scarecrow. Um, different franchise, totally different vibe. Um, Scarecrow. Kelly Murphy would be a good uh, Sandman, though. He would be, yeah. Um, he, God, yeah. Oh, my God, he'd be perfect. Holy shit. There you go. Anyway. Killian Murphy, one of the things that I said to um, Caleb, my boyfriend, while we were watching this was, I so badly just want to watch Killian Murphy play a sub suburban dad one day. Like, I just want that for him. Because he's a really, really menacing, really wonderful villain um, and creepy guy. But I do think that he has been typecast a little bit that way. Um, but he, I thought he was an incredible villain at the time and very, very compelling. Ryan reminded us that he was close to getting Batman in this movie and that Nolan liked him so much that he instead had him play the villain. Same thing happened, as we know, um, with in terms of Loki, that he originally auditioned to be Thor. I don't think he was close to being Thor, though. Um, with that in mind, I, I wonder your take on, on the villain, because and the other reason that I love... I love the villain in this movie is because it works perfectly with the overall themes. They're not in combat with each other, right? Like they are a hundred percent aligned, but not so that they feel on the nose. His weapon is fear. He has learned to weaponize fear and panic um, and turn it against them as has the league of shadows uh, as part of me, which is the other side of the coin of the league of shadows who, who understands fear enough to know how to weaponize it and know how to master it. But the fear is there either way. I think that a lot of times we think as human beings, we have to expel our fear, fear not be fearful. It's impossible. It's always going to be there. So I think this is actually a really cool lesson about channeling it. Yeah, it, uh, the villains kind of uh, kind of level up and, and work on that respect. Uh, my favorite villain in the film is uh, Falcone, um, who also tells you. Uh, the value of of fear, you know, he's he's got the whole city under his thumb because everyone's afraid of him. He could shoot Bruce Wayne in his club right then and there, and you know, I've got two councilmen, a couple of cops, uh, this guy, that guy. No one would uh, no one would accuse me of it. And it's like that to me almost seems like a lost opportunity because it's it, right th right there in that scene you get the sense that oh, this is a systemic problem in Gotham. You know, the whole everybody is is has succumbed to corruption. So like beating up Ra's al Ghul is not going to do it, Batman. Um, but that's probably a completely different movie. I mean, I will say that the idea that that the League of Shadows have been behind the economic collapse of the city as well. I, I think I think to your point undercuts the idea that fear is there, whether they're there or not. You know what I mean? And fear is what drives bad decisions. Right, um, it, it, you're right, because like I, I forgot about that part where they're like, yeah, we also caused the the Great Recession. Like, yeah. then it's like, oh, you kill the League of Shadows, and then everything's everything's hunky dory. Like, it's, yeah. that that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how it works, and I think you're right that it takes away from that villain also playing a role in in exposing that idea because you know the only reason people aren't standing, he's saying, I can sit here and shoot you, and God, it's chilling to think about. Um, I can shoot you in the face and get away with it. Um, because everyone is so afraid. And um, and I think you're right that it loses that power a little bit to think, oh, but the shadow group has been behind that the whole time because this is just a part of human nature, right? Yeah. Like he allowed his fear to drive him out of that theater and has had to live with that decision yeah. forever. Um, I was also struck on my rewatch, like Thomas Wayne, good dude. Good, good guy. <laughs> he was really uh, 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 maybe did more for the city than Batman. That's for sure. He built a nice train. Uh, he said he almost bankrupted uh, Wayne Enterprises trying to alleviate poverty, and like it worked. 
uh, until I guess the League of Shadows caused a depression. Um, could have been the blueprint for for saving Gotham instead of putting on the suit and practicing karate. Well, I think that they were saying that the League of Shadows caused the recession that he was trying to combat. So actually, said, like, yeah, and then he he was yeah. trying to combat, and and then he died, and then that sparked the wealthy of Gotham to to bring the city out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that it gets a little muddled in that particular area, but outside of that, he is great. And I think the other thing that's wonderful is that, like, clearly Bruce's love and care for his dad um, is and his mom. She's not as present in the film, no. but um, <laughs> mostly his dad, it seems, um, is what drives him. But I thought what was interesting at the end of the film is the idea of like your dad would be really proud. I'm like, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, he, he had a very different methodology. He had a very different set of values. Um, and it's not that Batman's values don't make sense. They do, but they're not his dad's. And had he been raised by his dad, he wouldn't have had perhaps that set of values. You know, this is not a guy that wanted to fight. And Russell, then that is made into his greatest weakness and his greatest downfall. And to some degree, I think what's interesting at the end of the film is like, clearly to to some level bruce still thinks that like i don't think he ever says yeah my dad blew it but he still believes um that he has to take action in a physical violent way which is not what his dad would have done definitely um i think without that lover man not a fighter (laughs) i mean the day he batman's such an interesting character to me because like i think if he uh he because he needs everything to be messed up for for him to exist like he Mm -hmm. needs the criminals as much as which is the point the joker's making like if if he were to solve crime or if he were to alleviate you know the conditions uh uh, that create crime in gotham city then there would be no batman like that is what he should be working towards but he's not uh but he still has a good reason to exist because in these universes there are you know, uh, insane guys wearing masks, uh, threatening to blow up the water tower or whatever. So, you know, you have to give it a little bit of uh, a break for being a comic book movie. And um, comic book movies generally don't deal with uh, uh, macroeconomic forces and stuff like that. It's usually about the individual taking on another individual. But I think you have to give it a, gr- a break, but also the credit that that, w- that door to that conversation and that question is opened up just by the fact that his father exists and he has that methodology. His, his way of dealing with the issues is to get to the systemic roots of it, right? Which is like, oh, people are poor. They don't have options. They don't have money. I'm going to make a train so that they can get around um, in an affordable way so they perhaps can get to work. I'm going to give some money to, to try and like get some folks educated and things like that. And Batman's like, I'm going to punch the joker in the face and <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 interesting too because they make batman or bruce wayne like a criminal in the beginning yeah um they have him steal and he's like i understand like this comes from desperation um uh largely <laughs> and then he just has a throwaway line like but i'm not like them i'm not like them right and that's never really made clear like but why aren't you why you, aren't you? Like, <laughs> you did in the same moment of desperation you took the same action so actually you are and i mean yeah. the bigger lesson in life is that we are all exactly like each other you know um but he is an interesting character in that sense because he is a hero um he's doing things that are uh, ostensibly and ultimately for the greater good like you needed him to take those actions you wanted him to stop that group of people from what they were going to do by setting the city into panic and having everybody kill each other um but at the same time yeah there's a there's a lot of questions to be asked which i do think that this film i don't know how intentional it was but certainly raises them and doesn't force an answer on it you know yeah i think it explores this stuff more fully but also incoherently in um dark knight rises with bane and stuff like that um but yeah and you know it's it's heavy stuff uh but i was also struck uh, rewatching it, like there's there's jokes in this movie. This movie has yeah. some jokes. There's some it's levity. One-liners. Yeah, there's some solid one-liners. Like Lucius is is slinging them out. Um, uh, obviously, Michael Caine's Alfred, fantastic. Uh, like this is not as uh, as darkness, dead parents as um, as its reputation is for sure. I had forgotten that too, actually. I'd forgotten that there, I, I thought it was like completely, in my memory, it was completely humorless and very, very heavy. And I was like, they are just 
whipping, you know, <laughs> yeah. like left, right, and center. These are one-liner quips. Even These Killian are... Murphy, like the doctor's not in right now. Like that's a yeah. Looney Tunes joke. <laughs> that is a hundred percent. And I think it's different. And I think the way reason it doesn't read like a Looney Tunes joke is because you don't have Schwarzenegger saying it, who was right. who's so trained to do that. Like I love him, but he was trained to do one-liners. He, you pause and say the line and then look at the camera, you know? They're, these actors are different actors, so the way they're saying it, it has a little more reality to it. Yeah. Um, as if two, two, two friends were just, or one madman was just quipping at each other. Um, yeah, Killian Murphy, man, I where is he? I love him. He's so good in this movie. Yeah, he was in, well, we can talk about it later. He was in this like weird little black and white movie that I saw last year that was, he was the best part of it. He's usually the best part of the small movie that he shows up in. Yeah. Um, so Batman Begins has begun. I think that we are saying that we found layers. I mean, even just in this conversation, to be honest with you, Spencer, it's like got me thinking about the movie in a way that I wasn't necessarily even thinking about it when I watched it last night um, in terms of the contrast between him and his dad and the different approaches. Um, yeah. What would but what would any of us be without what we're not? Like if everything that you thought you were here, right? Like, no, but seriously, if everything, I think when I was a little kid, you know what? Eh, Go on. Whatever, I'll do it. <laughs> so when I was a little kid, uh, I was like super weird. Um, and, and my parents weren't particularly religious, but I would just like, I was fascinated with the idea of religion. And um, I would go to like different churches and synagogues. I would go to like chant and like all mosques, just kind of on my own, super weird. Um, trying to figure out like the God stuff. And one of the things that occurred to me is like, if I got to the point in my life when I was really at peace and okay with myself in the world, I would probably just have to die because it would be done. Like life mm -hmm. would be done at that point because there wouldn't be anything left to accomplish or do or get over or think about. I, so I disagree, <laughs> but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Batman and I have more in common than I originally thought. I guess that's my lesson. I'm Batman. I guess that's the big takeaway. <laughs> Ross, I don't know what to say to that, but <laughs> I, I wish you well in your journey. You know, here my these are the philosophical musings of an eleven year old. <laughs> <laughs> you don't agree. I think that it, it's like a, even you know. Uh, uh, um, you know, Jesus and the Buddha and stuff like that, like even after they attain enlightenment, like they still, you know, they still put their pants on one leg at a time and, and go out and help people and do their thing. Like, um, I, you know, I think that if, uh, if, if we were to fix Gotham City, um, then Batman could be uh, reformed. We could we could defund Batman and then turn him into like a community <laughs> community service officer. Oh my officer. god! No, what's <laughs> that joke? Well, I think what we've learned is defund Batman. Yeah. No, yeah, okay. Ending it. I'm stopping it. I was gonna give you the compliment and say you were you were Mr. Wayne and I was Batman, but. Now I just think, may I think maybe you're the League of Shadows. Oh, you think Batman needs more money to punch more effectively? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is our look back on Batman Begins. Um, our rule on this channel is always, is always be Batman. Um, so I'm sure we'll be talking about Batman some more. But yeah, it did. It lived up to it lived up to the hype in my own mind. Um, but the arc of the story, I think you brought up this point before we were shooting the arc of the story really is in that first hour and a half with, mm -hmm. with bruce that's where it really the meat of it is and the heart yeah then they just got to do batman stuff till it ends uh but the tumblr is super cool we didn't talk about the tumblr that's very cool oh, yeah. talk about the tumblr it's yeah. the coolest batmobile that's the one i want yeah yeah huh. i like all of his gadgets um but i think that we proved with science that a grappling gun actually doesn't work i don't want the uh uh heels in your shoe that summon a swarm of bats that'd be terrifying and a surefire way to get coronavirus a hundred percent yeah no 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 those bats are swimming in corona yeah <laughs> Good talk. Thank you guys for joining <laughs> us today. Um, this is what happens when we pre-tape. And let us know in the comments below uh, if you, when was the last time you watched Batman Begins and does it hold up? Did it hold up? Did you have a different take on it now versus then? And we will be back on Monday with shenanigans. See you then. See you then.